uh, move on here. Let's start getting ready. Andrew here, Andrew Sartorelli will be our technical support specialist. He'll be presenting today. Uh, I will be co-hosting, trying to play the part of uh, devil's advocate a little bit, asking him some questions, trying to get uh, some uh, information out for you guys. So, Andrew, if you would uh, please uh, uh, get, get us started here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction there, James, and I want to thank everyone for uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll just start, you know, going over just a little bit about the Autodesk Help webinar series. Um, so we're doing these right now biweekly webinars for Nastra and NCAD. Um, they're hosted by myself uh, and some supporting the product worldwide, as well as um, some members of the sales team. It's just a 20 to 40 minute uh, discussion and demo session uh, with some Q&A thrown in there. Um, to go over some of the basics of an astro CAD as well as answer maybe some workflow questions uh, that you may have. And during that Q&A session, it's really just to ask us anything uh, point. So if you have something not necessarily related to uh, the topic that was discussed, but you want to know more about um, you know something else in astro CAD, certainly uh, let us know that. Uh, so I think this is the fifth or sixth uh, webinar that we've done. Um, the first one started out with just the basics of what is NAS training CAD and um, uh, two weeks ago uh, James uh, presented on uh, how to know if you have a good mesh in NAS training CAD. Um, upcoming on the 21st of July is how to get around the most common error messages and then on August 4th uh, we'll be doing a session on drop testing your design in NAS training CAD. Um, so we post uh, information about how to sign up for these. Uh, webinars on the Sim Hub. We also posted on the uh, Autodesk Nastra and NCAD forums. Uh, I believe we sent out some direct emails about it. And then once the sessions are done, we also do post um, a recording to the Autodesk Sim 360 uh, YouTube channel. And we also try to make our content available on a box folder. And I think we should see the slide deck. First slide there, the uh, the download link. Uh, so if you want to write that down, that's just autodesk.box.com forward slash Nastran NCAD IQ. And we're trying to make all the uh, PowerPoints and uh, demo models available for you to download. Um, so what's in the news? We just released uh, Hotfix 1 for Nastran NCAD 2016. Um, it fixes a number of issues. Um, Andrew, may I interrupt uh, you here for a moment? Sure. Uh, we're not actually seeing your screen. Oh, and that explains it. All right, let me just go back here a few slides. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Is that better? I can see it. All right, so as I was saying, we do this uh, bi-weekly session. Um, it's hosted by the support team, so myself, James Kubli, Dean Rose, uh, Marwan Azam, as well as a few others. And it's a 20 to 40 minute session. And uh, coming up in two weeks, we'll be talking about how to get around the most common error messages. And the download link, uh, like I said, is autodesk.box.com forward slash Nastran NCAD IQ. Um, so what's in the news? Um, we just released Hotfix 1 for Nastran NCAD 2016. Fixes a number of issues um, caused by non-US uh, number systems. So if you're in Europe, and you're using the uh, comma as the uh, decimal separator and the period as the grouping separator. There's a, still a few outstanding issues after the 2016 release. We've addressed those. Um, there's also some issues with automatic surface contact generation uh, with the same localization settings. Uh, those have been addressed, and we've also fixed a number of performance issues when dealing with uh, large models with a large number of surfaces. Uh, just some of the older news, we did release um, some self-paced training on the uh, Nastran NCAD uh, help page. And we've also released local help. So if you want to download the help, uh, if you're working in the field and you're not going to have access to the internet, great way to maintain access to the help documentation um, without uh, having to go online. Uh, just a, a couple of recent uh, articles. Uh, so if you're not familiar with ACAN, it's an Autodesk Knowledge Network, and it's where uh, you'll find troubleshooting uh, suggestions and articles uh, related to all Autodesk products uh, down the bottom there. It's a specific link 
or NAS training cap. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about connectors in contact, how to connect parts and assemblies. Uh, so really, uh, there's two, two topics, connectors and contact. Connectors involves uh, rods, cables, springs, uh, rigid body elements, and uh, bolted connections. And then contact, we're just going to go over automatic surface contact generation, automatic contact pair generation, and offset bonded contact. Now, uh, four weeks ago or so, we did have a webinar going over a contact in a little bit more depth. So I'm just going to cover some of the basics as it relates to uh, assembly models. So the first type of connector is a rod connector. Uh, it's really got three main properties. You've got your cross-sectional area, your polar moment of inertia, and your stress recovery location. Uh, it's only going to be able to act in tension and or compression. Um, so it's, it doesn't have any uh, way to capture bending. And it's going to connect two sketch points. Um, so you see on the left-hand side there, you've got endpoint of connector and endpoint of connector. Uh, you can select in your CAD model those two sketch points or vertices. Um, and that will create the connector between the parts. Next, we have cable elements. Um, so this is a bit unique in Autodesk's FEA portfolio. We don't really have something similar in Sim Mechanical. So it allows you to define an initial cable slack, uh, initial cable tension, and then an allowable stress for this cable. And it's only going to act in tension. So you're not going to have any compression there. Um, so if you're to push off on it, it, there's no stress generated in that element. But if you pull down on it, you'll see some um, axial stress. Um, and it allows, like I said, for preloading or slack to be defined. Uh, so the initial cable tension, um, you can have either or. So you can either have the slack or the tension. So obviously it doesn't make a lot of sense if you have an initial tension and a cable that's got slack in it. Um, and likewise, it doesn't you know, make sense if you've got slack, really can't have tension in that cable predefined. And uh, like the previous connector, it's going to connect two sketch points or vertices. Uh, next up, we've got spring elements. Um, so the spring connector is going to generate a C-bush element in the Nastran bulk data file. So we've got an option here um, to specify uh, directional stiffness for any of your degrees of freedom. Um, so you can say you only want to have a spring that's stiff in your uh, X direction and maybe your uh, rotation in the Y. Um, You've got the option here to specify any of the six uh, degrees of freedom. You've also got the option, uh, because it is a Seabush element in the National Bulk Data File, to specify damping. Uh, so that GE is going to be your damping coefficient. Um, and one great thing about spring elements is you can use them to stabilize an unstable model. So maybe you're running a linear static analysis, got a little gap between the parts or something like that. You can actually use spring elements to connect those with a very weak spring. You know, maybe your uh, stiffness is only one pound per inch, but you've connected the parts now, now that the model is statically stable. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Andrew. Actually, that's very, very handy when it comes to troubleshooting a, a linear static model that's not statically stable, is adding soft springs to it. The model will then solve, and it'll show you which part is displacing dramatically, and then you can look through it, see what contact or connectors that you may need to apply to it. Yeah, it's a, it's really a great option there to, um, to, to troubleshoot models. I know I run into a couple instances where uh, having added uh, spring elements, really, um, you're able to get to that next step in the model and figure out what else is, is going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so next up, we've got a rigid body um, connector type, and then the type is rigid. Um, so what this is going to do in your NASTRAN bulk data file, it generates RBE2, which are fully rigid elements. Um, so these elements add a significant amount of stiffness to your model and specified uh, degrees of freedom. Um, and how you create it is you specify an independent uh, sketch point or vertex, and then you specify dependent uh, face, edge, or sketch point. Um, it's going to connect the uh, dependent to the independent uh, center with rigid elements. Um, and then this technique, you can do things like create a, a wagon wheel um, to apply a, maybe a moment to a, uh, 
a solid element or a part made of solid elements um, because solid elements don't have rotational degrees of freedom. Um, but this way you can add in that rotation. Uh, so next up we have connector type uh, rigid body and then interpolation. So this is a slightly different method. It's using RBE3 in your Nastron bulk data file. And what it's doing is it's averaging the nodes on the, you'll see here on the uh, left hand side, we have the entities to average uh, fields. That can be a face, edge, or sketch point. And any grid points associated with those entities will uh, be averaged together. And then uh, that displacement will be applied to the reference vector or point, which can be a sketch point or a vertex. So this doesn't really add any additional stiffness to your model, like using the rigid um, type previously mentioned. Um, so this is a good alternative if you don't want to add in some artificial stiffness. So I just want to cover again real quickly about the wagon wheel, which you're referring to by the limitations of the way the rigid body elements have to be, or the rigid line elements have to be connected. Uh, they do need to be connected to a single point. Uh, they all need to be connected to a single point, but they branch out from there to whatever part surfaces, vertexes that you've connected them to. Uh, you can't have multiple of those on the same uh, connector, correct? Right. So you're only going to have one reference point, um, but you can have multiple entity. Um, if we go back, you can have multiple dependent entities but you can only have that one independent vertex. Um, so the nice thing, you can obviously have multiple rigid connectors if you're going to create multiple wagon wheels, but you just can't have those points connected to um, multiple rigid or multiple independent vertexes. Mm -hmm. So if you were to select uh, face one and connect it to one independent vertex, you can't then go and uh, select that face one again and define it to another independent vertex. Ah, that's good. Makes it less less chance of mistake with that. Uh, so right. rigid, rigid versus the the RBE two versus the RBE three. Now the rigid basically uses the penalty method, add stiffness, but the other one doesn't. But it seems like the other one, you would think that RBE three would be more beneficial because it doesn't add stiffness. Right. So the R RBE3 is going to use a, a multi-point constraint method uh, versus the uh, RBE2 method, which add, adds in those those rigid elements and uses the penalty method. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so next up, we have uh, connectors and, and bolts. Um, so bolts, uh, you'll see here, we get a graphical representation in a model. And I'm going to show a couple demos of a, a few of these in a, a minute here. Um, but just so you know, the, you're creating a graphical representation. It's not actually a CAD geometry that's being generated. Um, so what you actually generate with a bolt is you're going to generate some uh, rod elements and then a, be a central beam element running down this center of a hole. Um, so you, you'll define the surface or edge where the bolt head sits and the nut sits. You define a uh, bolt diameter. Uh, that's going to define the characteristics of the, uh, the central beam, and then you can define a head washer height and nut washer height. Um, and what that'll do is it'll uh, change the uh, how far the beam extends out from the uh, the surface or edge that it was uh, specified for. So you can see here, I've actually specified a, a nut or washer height, and that's where we get kind of that that pointed uh, peak there on each side. Um, also with bolts, you can define a preload. So you can have either have a, an axial or you can have a torque uh, applied to it. Next up, we have the cap screw. Oh, one um, so the cap screw. Andrew, sure. one sec. Right back to that bolt, the so preload. So out of, curiosity out of the preload here. From my experience, an axial or any of the preload doesn't actually take into account the material itself getting giving and squishing together, basically. Not like uh, in the real world situation when you're cranking down a bolt and you're creating that preload and you, def and you know what that preload is that you want. You, you tighten it up to that preload and you get that preload. But in simulation, because parts give a little bit, that preload is kind of an initial preload. It's, it doesn't know how much the, the two plates are going to basically uh, give and squish in together. So your final preload value 
may not be actually what you intended. It will probably likely be lower. So I'd like to point out that in that situation, always double check what your final preload is. And the only the way to correct that is you simply, it's it's generally a ratio. You look at what you, you wanted out of your analysis or what you wanted the preload in like a thousand pound force. And you only end up with like 700 pound force. You just take the ratio there and, and increase the, uh, your uh, initial preload to that that sort of same ratio, and you should end up with the with the same or the desired preload value that you're looking for. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, James. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of an iterative approach there. Mm -hmm. um, so the next type we have um, is the uh, cap screw bolt. Um, so this is slightly different. You, you don't end up with the uh, the nut. You just have the bolt head, and then you're going to specify the, the region for uh, the threaded surface. Um, you still get the option to define the head washer height, and the bolt diameter, and uh, a preload, um, but it's slightly different in that you'll see the, the graphical representation there. We only have the, uh, the head, but now if we look inside, so this is, uh, we'll open this up in the, Na the NAS file and the Nastrian editor. I'm just taking a screenshot here. We actually get um, rod elements, or um, bar elements, excuse me, um, radiating out um, towards that central beam element from the interior surface that we selected. Um, so this is similar to the tight fit option if you're familiar with simulation mechanical with our bolts there, um, where you, you get um, a series of, of bar beam elements and some mechanical connecting to that central um, beam. So just a little bit of a, a different uh, approach there depending on you know what you've actually got in your uh, your physical uh, model there. Um, so next, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, contact. So we've got a, a new feature in 2016 uh, for generating uh, surface contact. So uh, the first step, you can modify the settings for the uh, contact that's going to be generated. So on the lower left hand or right hand corner. You'll see contact data in the uh, analysis setup window there, and you can actually change the contact type that's going to be generated. So you can do bonded, uh, separation, uh, sliding, no separation, separation, no sliding, and offset bonded there. Um, you can specify a tolerance value as well, and it's going to search uh, within that tolerance value to generate some contact pairs. Uh, so simply, you click the automatic option now on the contacts panel on the ribbon, and it's going to go ahead and automatically generate some contacts. Uh, so again, this is new for the 2016 release. So if you don't see it on your ribbon there, you may be still using the 2015 release. Um, now this uses CAD geometry um, to generate these contact pairs. It doesn't use uh, FEA geometry. So if you've done some, some meshing where maybe you've only meshed a surface of a part and you've generated some, uh, some plate elements there, um, your contact pairs may not uh, match up there, so it's important to know that right now it's only working for only works for CAD geometry, and that's because it uses features from Inventor to uh, to generate those contact pairs. Uh, so this is an Inventor-only feature. If you're using SolidWorks, you excuse me, you won't see that option. Now, question for you, Andrew. So when you, I mean, this is very handy in in. Uh generating all those elements or those contacts instead of having to go through and define them. But can you go back through and edit them or edit the contact individually uh, after it generates all these contact items? Right, so that's the that's the great benefit there is you can go in and, and change the settings for each individual contact pair. So you'll see them in the ribbon. And I can pull up an example in the uh, demo in just a minute here. Um, you'll, you'll get the option to change you know, every uh, setting you normally would for a, a manual contact pair, it just automatically, based on your CAD geometry, generates that pair for you. So if you're working with a really large model, maybe you don't want to go through and manually create 500 contact pairs. Um, you can use the automatic option and generate those automatically and then go in and set those settings individually based on what you want. Or maybe you know most of your contact pairs are going to be bonded. Um, you can just simply generate all those contact pairs and then manually uh, change over some of them. Maybe you want separation or separation of sliding um, as some of those other contact pairs. That way you're not going through and generating uh, you know, all those pairs by hand. You can just modify the ones as needed. 
and the tolerancing can help you close or basically generate contact for gaps or even larger gaps. And so even if you find, even if it generates contact for gaps that you're not interested in, you could always def uh, remove that contact. So right. can save a lot of time. Yeah, so you can actually, yeah, you can go in and suppress those uh, those contact pairs if you, if you don't actually want them. Um, so next up, we just have the automatic uh, contact uh, generate option. Uh, so you can use the auto option when generating a manual contact. And it allows for the contact to be generated by the solver rather than through the pre-processing environment. So you're just specifying maybe the surfaces or you're just going to let the solver do it automatically. It's using the contact generate card um, in the Nastrin bulk data file. So the tolerance specifies the max activation distance. Um, when using the auto option. Now you can also leave it blank and it's going to default to uh, 1 e to the minus 4 times your model reference dimension. And that model reference dimension is just based on the overall dimensions of your model. Uh, so I believe it takes like the maximum length and then it multiplies it by this value. So how is this and, more beneficial than, uh, or how is this beneficial in a way that the, the automatic, the, uh, the previous uh, contact generation? Right, so this um, doesn't have as much setup in the pre-processing environment because it's handled all solver, solver side. Um, so if you want everything to be the same type of contact, you can just specify auto, you want everything bonded, specify good tolerance there, and then that's all you have to set up. Um, and it, the solver is going to take care of generating all that contact for you um, rather than you having to go in and gener manually generate contact pairs. Uh, so depending on the model you have, it may be easier to use this automatic option. Okay, thank you. Um, and the final one I want to mention uh, that's a little bit, again, unique to NAS training CAD is the offset bonded contact type. Um, so this allows you to bond surfaces or edges um, that are separated by a gap. Um, so you can select a, a, an aster entity as a surface or a face, and then you can select an edge. Um, so here we've, I've got a plate, um, that, uh, two plates, and I've meshed one as just a surface and one as a solid part. And I'll so show the example of this in uh, just a moment here. And we've actually bonded them um, even though there's a gap between them. And NAS training CAD in the, bulk, uh, in the solver side will actually generate C-bush elements with the stiffness um, value that kind of is calculated there so you're not generating overly stiff connection between the parts. Um, so at this point, I'm going to jump into a few demos and hopefully answer a few questions folks have had. Um, so the first one I want to go through is the uh, spring element example here. Um, so what I've done, and I'll just delete this. Uh, is I've generated a, a simple catwalk, um, such as a, a flat plate, and we've got some uh, cable elements in here. And I'll just show how to set that up real quick. So we go connectors, new. I'm going to say I want a cable. And we've got two endpoints. I'm going to select endpoint one, endpoint two. I'm going to say there's no slack, there's no pretension, cross-sectional area of one. We'll just buy it, specify a mode area moment of inertia there. All right. So Quick got, question for you, Andrew. Sure. Does order of operation of the nodes that you pick matter? Is there a beginning and an end, or is it uh, irrelevant? I believe it's irrelevant. I haven't run into any issues specifying them in, uh, in different orders. OK. Uh, just to point out real quickly, people, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, you can ask them right now. We'll answer we'll answer them along the way, or we can wait towards the end. It's up to you. But please uh, send us any questions you have during the now during the presentation. Um, so what I've done, I've just added a, a gravity load here, and I've set up some fixed constraints um, along the top of all these uh, cable element or cable connectors. Excuse me. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. That's going to take a minute here uh, to, to run. 
Let's do a little bit of iteration. Um, so let's just take a look and see if we got any any questions. None at this moment. All right. So with your setup here, is there anything anything particular we might, might want to know is, so you've got a gravitational load, right, on this catwalk? Right, just just to have the weight of the, the catwalk itself. And um, we'll see, we're, we're iterating here still, but we'll see that the, um, you know, the catwalk bends down and we're only going to see a uh, tension load on uh, these two middle elements here and we'll see no uh, loading on the far elements, the far connectors. We do have a question. Um, uh, Eric would like to know if the moment of inertia, uh, can the moment of inertia be calculated by the program and not estimated by the user? It sounds similar to like the weights and center of gravity that simulation mechanical has. I don't think think we so uh, for the setup of the um, the cable elements I think what he's referring to let me okay. just take a look here don't think we have that option built into the cable element itself um, I think with some of the other element types we've got a, um, a oh, okay. beam creator so you pick a cross section it may um, make you may be able to pull some information from there um, so we'll take a look at the contours here, and we're just looking at solid stress, but let's toggle this, and we're going to do actual dis oh. total, and we're going to look at the actual displacement. So we can see the, the catwalk tips down on its own weight, um, but we can take a look at the uh, cable stress. And we'll just display. It's a little bit hard to see at the moment, so we'll go into settings, uh, display, connectors, apply, and contour. There we go. So we can see we get a uh, almost a, a a thousand um, psi stress in the cables there, and in the back ones we get zero. Um, so there's no uh, compressive compressive load on the, uh, the cables allowed. So what we can do, I guess that this is the active analysis. I've actually added now a force on this back one here, a uh, fairly large force. We'll take a look, um, about 3,600 pounds. And give this a run. Again, this will take a minute to run here. And you may be asking, you know, we, there's line, lines on the back side, why aren't they on the front side? So again, this only requires um, points. It doesn't require lines uh, to generate those cable elements. Um, so I went in and I I sketched the two lines on the back, and then I just did uh, points on the front to show uh, that really you only need points and not uh, lines. So we'll take a look at the contour options, cable stress. And again, now we can see we've got some, some forces there on the back side, and if we wanted, you know, we could probe those and see uh, individually what, those, what that stress value was. So that could be handy um, in uh, other forms of constraint. Well, if you want a tension, uh, constraint and tension, that can be definitely handy, not necessarily have to use it as a cable. I can't think of any particular examples right now, but uh, if you have a constraint that needs to re restrict the motion in a, a, a single direction, you could use these cables in that sense too. Right. Um. So we'll, we'll jump over to another uh, kind of simple example here. I'm just going to show off some of the um, the bolted connections here. Um, so I've just got two plates, and I've got one 
one surface over here fixed, and I've just got a, a force pulling on the the other surface there. And this is a, a two, just a simple two-part assembly. Um, so what I can do, I'm going to remove uh, this connector here. I can just go in and, and manually create that. So scroll down, connectors. I'll create a new connector. We're going to say it's a bolt. All right, so we need to select the uh, the surface or edge here. So I'm going to select this edge as the bolt head. And I go down here, select this edge as the nut. So if we wanted to, we could go in and add a washer. And that's just going to modify that, the height. So we saw in the, the PowerPoint kind of made that peak out a little bit more on the overall length. Um, so we don't necessarily have to do that. And we've just got a material defined to it. Give this a run now. And while that's running, I'm just going to take a look at the, the file here. So um, I'm going to pull this up in the Nastrain editor. Um, so this is goes with standalone Nastrain, but it's, it's useful to take a look at um, what actually gets generated with some of these. So with the bolted connection, like I said, it's not CAD geometry that gets generated. It's FEA elements. Um, so you can see here, um, you know, it pokes out a little bit with a, a washer on the top, but no washer on the bottom. And it's strictly uh, flat, flush with the surface. And we've got some uh, beam element and then some bar elements radiating out from the center. All right. Let's see if we've got any more questions here. Okay. So now you, we can see uh, we're sliding. We've got that part sliding. And we'll just show displacement. Can animate that. And it's just slide. Oh, we'll turn on deformed options. So it's sliding slightly. It's probably an exaggerated scale there. So if we click actual, you can see it's very small. Um, but we're generating, if we look at stresses, contour options, we'll take a look at the solid uh, stress here. And so we're, we're generating stresses as a result of this uh, bolted connection here. Now it's important to note um, that if the bolt itself is your primary area of, of interest for your analysis, it's um, probably not beneficial to go ahead and use this, this uh, representation of a bolt. You actually want to physically model the bolt. This is more for simplifying uh, down a, a large model uh, where the area of the bolt is not of interest. Um, so if you've got a, a really big part and it's bolted and connected in all sorts of ways, but you know those bolts and those areas aren't really of interest, um, it doesn't make sense to have the CAD geometry in there. It makes more sense to have this simple um, FEA representation with some rod and beam elements. Yeah, it, on that on that note, there it, it better accurate or, or it more accurately models the way things are connected, so you get an overall behavior. But locally, at at where the bolt connects, as you can see in the model, you can see how he's got the high stresses right there, right around the edge of it. So it it doesn't necessarily accurately model the stresses right there, but it gives you it's the effect on the model, the way it constrains the model, constrains the parts together is what you're really looking for with these bolted connections, and it also helps simplify. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, it, it greatly simplifies the uh, the amount of parts and geometry that you have in your model. Right. And when you, you're working with those large assemblies, it's really important to, to try to get that part count down because uh, it's not exactly a linear relationship between uh, the number of elements and the time it takes to solve. Mm -hmm. um, so we can take a look at another example I did here. I'm just going to do a yeah, set this one as active. Um, so what I did here is I, I kind of mirrored the approach, but I, I, I used rigid elements and a central uh, beam element 
to, to replicate a, a bolt. Um, so this is what it actually gets generated, uh, or close to what gets generated when you're using the bolted connection. Um, so you may have seen I had a, a sketch line in there, and I've gone ahead and used it, defined a physical property for it. Um, I've just defined it as a, a bar element, and I picked a simple cross section here. Um, and here's where you can generate some of those uh, moment of inertia uh, if you needed to. So if you knew your cross section or your cable element, uh, but maybe you didn't know some of these other properties, go in and, and specify it here, and you can generate some of those values. Uh, and then I've just gone in and I've created a rigid uh, connector using uh, the rigid option. So my independent is this top vertice here, and then I selected the outer ring, the edge there. And we can go ahead and run. And we should get fairly similar results here. Again, I'd like, just like to remind uh, people on the presentation, please ask your questions. We love your questions. We want to answer them. We want to make sure everybody understands uh, the material. So while that's running, we can take a quick look at this model here. What I'll do is I'll remove that contact. So what I've done is I've got two, uh, two, two parts here that I created. So it's the same uh, that I used in the, the bolted plates. I just rotated one, and I've got it aligned. Uh, so the surfaces right there are coplanar. And I've now used the element or the physical property definition. I've selected associated geometry. I've just selected that one face there. Um, to generate uh, just a plate elements on that singular face, and we've selected uh, quad elements. But now we can use, if we wanted to, we could try using the automatic uh, surface contact generation. So I'm just going to edit the parameters, say offset bonded. I know my gap is something like 0.2, so I'll go with 0.3, and it should pick this up here. Looks like it didn't. So we'll go ahead and manually create that. We'll select manual. We're going to go edge to surface. We're just going to select a the face there. You can right click and select an edge. And I'm just going to click that edge. Um, three. And we want to offset bonded there. All right, we're going to update all mesh. That looks good. We've got our surface contact there, and I've just added in a fixed constraint on this surface here, and I've applied a, a force to that edge there. All right, that one runs pretty quick. So we're looking at the uh, shell stress here. So we can take a look here. Obviously, it's a plate with a hole, so we get some uh, stress concentrations on the side, but let's take a look at the uh, displacements to show that the parts are in fact connected with that offset. Uh, so we'll look at just displacements, and now we can see, um, you know, we've got some displacements larger on the uh, top edge here, and then uh, decreasing as we go down the plate. But you see the uh, plate displacement, and right along the edge there with that solid part are about the same. So we know those parts, you know, those are solidly bonded together. Like I said before, the offset bonded uses uh, C-bush elements. And we'll just go, and now we can take a look at the contours, options, display. We need to load our results here. There we go. So again, we, we start to see those, those higher stresses on that uh, inner surface there. And that we just need to keep in mind that those aren't necessarily realistic. Um, but we can do look at displacement. And we can see that the bolted connection keeps those two parts together.
All right, looks like we may have a, a question here. All right, so uh, we do have a question. Is the mass problem of the bolt uh, solved in 2016 when you define a material? Um, so I don't believe uh, that's been addressed yet. Um, so I believe what uh, George is talking about there is if you specify, let me just go into a, set this one as active. If you were to specify a bolt here, um, you're able to uh, specify material. Um, if the results of your analysis are dependent on the total mass, it may be better to go in and uh, define some of these properties uh, by hand rather than using the material properties um, because that would make your bolt dependent on the number of uh, elements created. Uh, let's see. Any other questions there? All right, so the, the last one we'll take a look at is just the uh, cap screw. And again, this is just a, similar to the, the regular bolt. Um, we're just defining inner surfaces. So I'll go ahead and remove this and add a new one. Specify new. We go to bolt, cap screw. All right, and we want the bolt head, so we'll just select this surface. And then we want the regions where it's threaded into. So you can select the inner surface there, and we're going to select the inner surface there. So we get the, the graphical representation there of the bolt. You can specify a washer height again, and we should be all set there. And it's going to take a, a minute or two here for it to iterate. Um, oh. Got a question there, Andrew. All right, let's see. Is it possible to simulate helial coils? I'm not quite sure um, what those are. If you could explain that in a little more depth for us. You're talking about potentially the uh, springs? All right, so let's just pop back into the PowerPoint here. And at this point, you know, you can ask us um, anything you'd like. Um, we'll make the PowerPoint available and some of the demo models available. Um, at the uh, hyperlink at the bottom here, so autodesk.box.com forward slash Nastran NCAD IQ. And I'll just give him a moment here to, to clarify his question. Well, on that uh, helicoils, are you referring to the thread repair kits that you can use? Okay, yes, that's what he's referring to, Andrew. It, I don't know, possibly, if we can simulate. Basically, it's it's 
they look almost like a wire spring. I'm not familiar with them myself, but uh, you basically use this to repair threads, uh, or not repair threads, but to, uh, it's an insert that goes in to replace okay. the threads. Ah, okay, so if the thread is damaged, you would, it would place this in, potentially? Correct, and it threads in too, and it provides threads on the other end. It looks like a spring, a coil. Okay. Hmm. So uh, I guess it would depend on what, what type of operation they're threading that in. Um, I could see that being a fairly complex uh, simulation to, to set up there. If you were doing something like that, it, that would be the point of the analysis. I don't know if you would be able to use, if you had a large complex assembly, the detail that you would need to capture for the, the helicoil would would dramatically slow down the analysis. In, from my opinion, it would look like this would be something that you want to focus purely on that as your analysis and modeling that the parts, uh, that specifically and in detail. Right. Yeah, I, I know from, from past models I've done, uh, setting up anything like a screw or anything with threads is, a, is fairly difficult um, to get that to set up, uh, you know, correctly and to solve. Usually if you do get it, you know, set up and running it, it takes a significant amount of time for that analysis to run uh, just because of the, the large amount of uh, surface contact you've got involved in that model. Um, you know, it's highly nonlinear. It's, it, it takes a lot of uh, computation to chew through all that. It is so. So basically, it is possible. The question is, is or, or, or it, it boils down to, is basically, it's going to be a detailed, it's going to be a difficult analysis. It's it's likely possible to do it, uh, but the validation of the results is also going to be difficult too. To know if you've got it set up right or correctly. Great. Um, so we'll give everyone else a, another minute or two here if they've if they got any other questions. Um, you know, feel free to ask us if it's, you know, like the helical oil is not necessarily related to um, connectors. Um, but if you've got any questions about capabilities of NCAD or anything along those lines. And feel free to reach out to us if you come up with questions afterwards, too. Uh, through, we have various forms of media uh, contact. You can log a case if you have access to support. We'll be glad to help you there. Uh, you can reach out to us on the forums uh, through uh, Twitter, I believe, too. Yep, at Autodesk Help. Um, if you, you're stuck and you can't figure out how to get in touch with us, um, we've got at Autodesk Help on Twitter, um, and someone should be able to uh, help you out through that mechanism as well. So it looks like all the questions have kind of run out. So um, at this point we'll end the webinar. I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, if, if they have uh, you know any other questions, um, certainly like James said, feel free to reach out to us in the forums or attend any of our future webinars. Well thank you Andrew for the presentation on the, the different forms of connectors. Rods uh, basically are similar to truss elements. The contact uh, bolted connectors are definitely very, very handy uh, when it comes to large assemblies. Because most things are, a lot of things are connected by screws, bolts.